Uh, it, I wrote um, the original paper, to really proposed it as my thesis, was Topping the Zero Point Energy, the very first paper of my very first book. Uh, and that paper launched me there. Thank you, Greg. Uh, that it would, um, uh, Iring in Utah, Iring Research Institute turned out to be interested. The paper got circulated by Fax and Xerox. Uh, and I was proposing that it was part of systems engineering where I was getting my PhD because something happened 1977 that allowed me to build the case in standard science. Uh, prior to that, uh, the physics professors that really knew about zero point energy said, well, that's just random fluctuations, pretty well treated as noise. It's not significant in, in, in the background, except, except that it was in the, in the vacuum polarization, both experiments and, 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 and theory that there can be interactions, especially around the heavy particles, where the steep lines of polarization would converge on the nucleus. And so uh, that, that kind of was the key the key, key to the, what do you do to activate the, the energy? The, uh, what allowed it to exist in systems engineering was the uh, Nobel Prize work of Ilya Prigogine, who showed how systems can evolve from chaos to self-organization. And this was the critical, this met the critical objection that the zero point energy is treated just like noise and therefore no coherence could have happened. And, and if that's the way it is, right, that of course that conclusion is correct. But the models in the physics literature were not necessarily that way at all. And, and so I was looking for the experiments and then I learned of the free energy community hearing about, oh, inventors stumbling across it. And so perhaps the key big event for my life was the synchronicity of, of my name. Uh, I believe it was in 1976, I learned of an inventor called T. Henry Moray that happened to be in Utah. Greg, you could show, show him the book. Oh, yeah. I was destined I, to write this book. This one right here. Yeah, uh, because the inventor's last name was identical to my first name, spelled identically. Interesting. And wow. uh, so that, really hit me between the eyes with the two by four where I said, wow, now you got my attention, right? So, uh, All right, well, I now you got to get our attention because you got to let us know exactly what zero point energy is. Yeah. Is there a difference between that and vacuum energy? Let's kind of go back to, so that everyone knows what we're talking about here. Well, I could, I guess I could bring up some pictures so it helps. Yeah, okay. okay. Well, just in a, a quick sentence, I mean, do you know, I mean, is, is there a difference between zero point energy and vacuum energy? It's or all are they, under the same, same name, zero point uh, energy. Okay. It's what's, what comprises the fabric of completely empty space. So it used to okay. be called an ether. And so the, uh, it, it was a hydrodynamic model, classical uh, electromagnetism was based on it. Uh, it's Maxwell's equations and, and that sort of a thing. In, uh, and uh, it evolved, so it's very interesting. So first we have an ether that was around for a few hundred years in science, mm -hmm. and perhaps even f further back on just philosophy and things like that. There's something in the fabric of space, uh, certainly to support the propagation of life. In, um, so 1905, uh, special relativity was accepted by the scientific community. And it was much easier to do calculations by just saying there is no ether at all. In, uh, in special relativity or in, in general? Special, in okay. special relativity. So this was, this was the, but, uh, but you had, to, the scientific community had to accept the existence of a rubbery, rubbery space time. It used to be Newton's laws were perfect. Uh, linear progression of time, uh, three dimension of space, I would say that that classical physics at the at the era at that era was the golden age of science, where they really thought they had the theory of everything, and they said there was only uh, two, two two flaws in it. But I'll, I'll get to that in just a moment. But they were willing in 1905 to throw out the ether uh, at the time. Relative relativity was accepted okay. but it didn't last very long 25 years later uh, we have quantum mechanics and quantum electrodynamics being accepted in 1930 and this is where the background 
the, what comprised the fabric of space was dynamic fluctuations of high energy, like microscopic lightning, except at a very tiny scale, the Planck length is, is the scale, 10 to the minus 33 uh, uh, centimeters. Um, it was energetic. It was more modeled as a turbulent plasma than it, than it was um, of fluid dynamics, which even offered greater opportunities for self-organization and, and energetic activities, including, this is what they stress, pair productions, electron-positron pairs just spontaneously uh, exist and come to life in the fabric of space that come to appearance and disappearance. That's a tremendous self-organization where, where that actually happens and, and was happening in experiments when you do energetic experiments. They see tons of pair production from the vacuum. So there's a, there's a critical self-organization and that, that was the, the key to tapping it because the vacuum itself could spontaneously self-organize and you could induce it with nuclei. And that's what was... T. Henry Morey discovered he was making plasma tubes and he said the key for his plasma tubes to make the energy device was to oscillate the ions, the heavy particles. And darn if that didn't match the literature on, on quantum electrodynamics where the interaction with the vacuum is, is uh, it's very powerful when you work with the ions, especially when you work with lots of them. So the theme of my work Really, I credit T. Henry Morey with the, with the critical concept, working with the heavy particles. And so I uh, either oscillation groups of ions, creating vortices of, of ions, uh, creating vortex rings of ions. And in fact, you didn't really need to have to do the nuclei of, uh, of the plasma itself. Any charge motion, dust, uh, anything that would start up in the vortex, as long as it was charged, you would start to get this self-organizational effect and excess energy and always appearing. So it's one heck of a paradigm change to say it could be that easy that you just work with the heavy particles. Uh, or in that, that was the key. Go ahead. Well, I just for those that don't know anything about you know a zero point energy or all this stuff, if it's, if it's completely new me. to them, yeah. Then, yeah, we um, got some, we I got just, some terms defined here. I got yeah, we got, we got, we got to slow <laughs> down a little bit. I represent the super layman. <laughs> That's super. So I just want to, again, I want to get your definition <clears throat> of zero point energy. And then I also want to talk about what does that mean? In other words, you haven't talked about like the Tesla Society, you know, Tesla Tech and, and some of the other things. What are people trying to do with this information? Yeah, that that's what I'm interested in. Is what has come about from it? Because there's a yeah, lot. Yeah, so actually. if we could there's go there first and then delve into Well, yeah, the definitions depth. first. We got to get everyone on the same page. We got to understand what zero point energy is. Do you have, you said you had some pictures that would help clarify? Sure. Let's I, do I some can, slides. Bring, then. Yeah. Okay. Or slow John, down. feel free to jump in. Yeah, don't, no. don't feel, uh, no. Intimidated. Don't feel intimidated it's, it's, because you don't it's know. It's like a. Yeah. Double Dutch. Da, 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 da. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to trip all over myself. Yeah, no, no. But ask a question. Just say, all right, what is power production? I'm a PowerPoint guy, so this is good. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, was... that, that is, uh, well, that's great. Well, uh, if you're experiencing what I experienced, right? I, yeah, I learned that it exists in 74. Never heard of it. The quantum vacuum. What's in the vacuum? Uh, we heard of the ether, things like that. What What's in it? That was the key question. Uh, back in the 1800s, it gave rise to uh, an ether. It was like a, treat it like a hydrodynamic model with vortices and things like that for the magnetic fields, the electric fields. And then the uh, famous Michelson and Mor Morley experiment came along and they, and they, said, well, I don't see the fringe shifts in, in any, anything else uh, for, from the ex, these experiments. But there were, there, it, Michelson's experiments continued with uh, Dayton Miller, and he did it up on Mount Colomar. And he says, wow, I can start to detect it. He made an interferometer 10 times more sensitive. He worked with Michelson. And he was giving, uh, they were seeing a detection of an ether model as if the Earth is dragging it with it like a boundary layer model that happens in, um, in normal hydrodynamics. 
So they're getting evidence of it. It's just when you're at sea level, they got the same results as Michelson at sea level, not much because it was stationary relative to the Earth. As soon as they increased in elevation, they were starting to see uh, evidence of the ether drift and the ether wind and these types of things were, were occurring. So these and experiments so, uh, are designed to, to, ta to find and discover some tangible evidence that there is some fabric to space. Right. That's what these uh, are. As, okay. as a original, original um, modeling of, of just hydrodynamics. And they're seeing some evidence that even that old model seems to ha have aspects to it. Okay. And then so, uh, but Einstein, um, there, it, it looked like our, our physics was really perfect in classical physics. They call it, the, except for two unexplained things. Um, <laughs> The black body radiation yeah, spectrum yeah. That's, wasn't quite right. And atomic stability, according to classical physics, um, atoms should be unstable as, as the electron spirals around. It should radiate all its energy away. And therefore, according to our best theory of physics at the time, they concluded nothing exists. So, <laughs> so, so they called them two sm small I clouds. <laughs> <laughs> this is all an no, illusion. Sorry, all of you are violating the laws of physics. I'm sorry. I violate as many laws I as I can in a day. Well, sorry for violating. <laughs> yeah. so kind of, kind of my it, thing. It, it ushered in the era of quantum mechanics. Yeah. I mean, there was very various interpretations of quantum mechanics. And so this is one of my favorite cartoons. Can you see it okay? When I need to yeah. it up. Yeah, no, it's good. So it up like that. There we go. And so, and um, so this gave rise to the uncertainty principle, the concept of energetic vacuum and pair production. Pair production means uh, electron-positron pairs spontaneously organize and pop out of the vacuum and then disappear. In, in so annihilation term. because of opposite uh, polarity, but equal yeah, in every yeah. other regards. Okay. So that type of thing, and and so this this started to launch. But notice that we have a twenty five year history where the vacuum by the scientific community was considered completely empty from nineteen oh five when relativity came along, the, that Michelson and Morley experiment, till nineteen thirty, where quantum mechanics put this energetic vacuum back in far more dynamic uh, and it would give rise to what Wheeler called uh, the quantum foam and its electrical flux enters into our three-dimensional space and immediately exits in this turbulence so imagine these tiny tiny holes where electric flux that's electric field energy enters and then immediately leaves in this turbulence so we have the extremely active under underpinning to what they call the zero point energy or the vacuum energy. By the way, the word zero point uh, came, from, which me, which referred to what happens in completely empty space at absolute zero, zero degrees Kelvin, where there's not supposed to be anything there, no heat, no light, nothing, no matter what is left, what is the fa fabric of space? And then it was the zero point energy or the vacuum energy. It's this more fundamental thing to all of, of creation. Um, and did they actually the, detect, did they actually take experiments and bring it to absolute value and then uh, um, detect that there was never, energy? You can never get that low. So is it mathematically close. that they actually kind of reduced it down and, and bring out the uh, all of the temperature and no, bring they, out all they, the parameters oh, with it? How did they yes. get that? Okay. Yes, they, 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 they see in the in experiments, no matter what they do, this energetic activity. And Good. that's why the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, no matter what, it always exists. All systems are interacting with it. You can never uh, make it go away. Uh, where does it come from? And that this is where uh, Wheeler, it comes from a higher dimensional space. So the physicists are really, really good at understanding higher dimensions. They, they, they work with it all the time in their modeling and things like that. The engineers struggle with it. They think we only have the three dimensions of space. Now to understand it, you have to pretend you're, you're to intuitively understand it, you're a flatlander. Let's say pretend you're stuck on a plane and you can only look out across like a table surface 
and that's that's known as uh, the flatland slot, where you only see in two dimensions. You can only you can't you have no awareness of up up or down. You can only look out across the plane, and then um, in the model the or the energy comes through at right angles to the plane, it's like a rainstorm, always happening. So it enters and leaves, enters and leaves, and when it's in, this would be on the left, the incoherent vacuum fluctuations, the quantum foam that's just turbulence. If there's a slight tilt to it, we'll call it a polarized vacuum, and then a little bit uh, lines in our flatland slot that's somewhat coherent. And then there's speculation, well, if there's vortex action in it, it gives rise to the elementary particles, and their existence is due to the, the feed of the vacuum energy. So it's like the flow of, uh, of the river is like the vacuum energy, and the whirlpool is the manifestation of the particle that we see, and we, and we typically can't see macroscopically the, the actual flow that's feeding in itself because it's coming from a higher dimension. So this is the orthogonal flux theory of the zero-point energy. It's what Wheeler uh, proposed. Uh, it's too difficult to do any real calculations in, in its crude form. It was not popular because you really couldn't do much with it as far as uh, calculations concerned. How do you predict oh, when self-organization occurs and when the electron-positron occurs? There's no fundamental first principles at all that would predict further physics on this model, and yet we see the evidence that this is happening. And tremendous energy densities are available, and that's because it's constantly fed from a higher dimension. So you, you can tap into that. And so we all how calculated- do, I, I question, if it may, if, um, how, how do we know, or why do we suspect it's coming from a higher dimension, and what is a higher dimension? Okay, so you have to reason by um, analogy, mm -hmm by pretending uh, you're, you're a flatlander, you, you are yeah. being uh, confined to a simple plane like a tabletop. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, you know, the engineers had trouble with this too. That, but I read Flatland, oh, when I was in junior high school. It was written by a mathematical, right. oh, yeah, yeah. little fictional Not familiar book. with it. Over 100 years old. Yeah, okay. uh, but it was a math guy who was teaching higher dimensions, mm -hmm. and the physics people could easily entertain the idea. Can we, can we stay and, and I can see we, how, Yeah, go ahead. I can see uh, how engineers struggle with this because it's, it's a way above. The, it, for an engineer, it is or it isn't within the realm of their what they have, and yeah. this is way above that. So it's yeah, and, kind of a and yet you can end up them. doing experiments but you're going to be astounded where'd the energy come from you have conservation of energy right yeah so and it, they don't i don't think it's they considered think impossible that, uh, and yeah. and so i asked the question wheeler answered it i, I he asked the question and he just calculated it. he called it already unified field theory and he says it comes from a higher dimensional space and what year was this again his theory Yes, uh, he wrote the uh, early, uh, Wheeler was early 60s, the okay, book 60s. came out, Geometric Dynamics, and this yeah, was my original introduction, I went right out and got Wheeler's book, because mm -hmm. uh, the Gravitation book, the last two chapters referenced Geometric Dynamics, and he was one of the authors, so I went right out and got his book, and, and so that means he was doing his research and his writing probably the late 50s, where he was working on the idea and he published his book um, Geometric Dynamics so there it was in our library I said wow the boy are the engineers going to be surprised about this hey if you like these kind of conversations and you'd like to see more click like and subscribe to our channel and if you're at the computer and you'd like to hear the whole podcast click right here